These are the helipads at On K. Here at the Camp Radcliffe headquarters of the 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile, the problem of excessive weight in airborne command communications equipment is being solved. These technicians are preparing to check out a recently developed lightweight system installed in this helicopter. The newly designed communication system weighs only 150 pounds, as opposed to the previously used 600 pounds of equipment. In addition, this lightweight unit provides the airborne CP with two different radio frequencies and a multiple outlet intercom. Known as the ANARC-122, the system is composed of two ANVRC-46 radio receiver transmitters and the intercom channels. Three whip antennas mounted beneath the helicopter fuselage give the command radio system a range of 24 to 32 kilometers. In actual use on a combat mission, the compact communications unit is operated by the commander's S3 officer and by an artillery fire support officer. The commander gives his orders to the other officers and the helicopter pilot via the intercom. Upon receiving the orders of the commander, the S-3 relays the message to ground commanders using one of the two available channels. Simultaneously, the artillery officer can be in contact with the FDC on the other channel if desired. An extremely flexible command post in the sky. Camp Radcliffe drops away in the distance as the airborne CP heads for the Central Highlands. Another search-and-destroy mission is about to begin. High above the area where the assault troops will establish a landing zone, the commander and his S-3 evaluate the terrain features below. Map coordinates are studied. In a low-level examination of the surrounding countryside, a suspected Viet Cong village is located. It is decided to call up an artillery fire support mission in the immediate vicinity of the landing zone. On the ground at the FDC, the information is received through a PRC-25 radio telephone. The mission is plotted using the data received from the airborne CP. A phone call is then made to the battery commander and he is given complete firing data. The M-102 howitzers are made ready for the mission. Then, the lightweight, air-transportable tube artillery goes into action. Aboard the flying CP, the commander observes the shelling of the wooded cover adjacent to the landing zone. By this time, the assault helicopters are arriving at the objective. As the first wave of choppers reaches the LZ, troopers of the 1st Air Cavalry Division leap to the ground and begin moving toward the cover of the nearby wood line. The unit commander receives intelligence from the airborne CP regarding the unmapped village ahead and possible location of the enemy. A mortar crew sets up its weapon and prepares to shell the thick cover on the perimeter of their position. The information they have received from the commander, flying overhead, is checked against their map. Then, firing commences. In the air, the artillery officer confers with the commander. The troops advancing toward the village encounter dense undergrowth, 
and progress is slowed as they push through clinging weeds and brush. All sense of direction can be lost in the heavy vegetation. A halt is called while this platoon gets reoriented. A check is made with the airborne command post to make sure the unit is moving in the right direction. The airborne commander observing the location of the troops issues corrective instructions. With compass and map, the platoon moves ahead, reaching the village shortly thereafter. Tunnels ever present in the villages of Vietnam are located and searched for hidden enemy personnel. While the tunnel runner is below ground, security is provided by posted guards. This complex of underground passages proves to be empty. With a deserted village behind them, the flying cavalrymen move to the LZ and signal for pickup. The search and destroy mission is completed, and soon the choppers arrive to take the men out. Now satisfied that there are no Viet Cong in the area, the airborne commander also returns to An Khe. The modern communication system, ANARC-122, has done its job well. At Tonsonut Air Base, Saigon, is a heliport handling a high volume of rotary wing aircraft traffic, ranging from the Sioux to the Chinook helicopters. These aircraft are largely from Army units based outside of Saigon. A control tower mobile van mounted on a two and one half ton truck is used for controlling the traffic. Here, the wind direction is being communicated by radio to Huey helicopters preparing to land at the Saigon heliport. Also situated at Tonsonut is an army facility for the maintenance of electric generators in use by air traffic control personnel throughout Vietnam. Here, maintenance is performed on generators of all sizes, from one and a half to 15 kilowatt, 60 cycle generators, and the 400 cycle generators used to supply radar systems. Incoming generators are checked, deficiencies noted, and the equipment again put into good operating condition. At Vung Tau, 125 kilometers southeast of Saigon, is an airfield in continual use by fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft. Traffic handling facilities include a control tower and a ground control approach radar system for use in inclement weather. This modern radar system includes a means of identifying friend or foe. I'm Colonel Aronson, CO, 4th Transportation Command, a part of the U.S. Army's 1st Log Command in Vietnam. Our mission is to run Saigon Port Complex. This includes the ports of Saigon and subport activities at Na Bay and Vung Tau. Ships transit the river system from Vung Tau area on up the river to the Na Bay River and up here into the Saigon River to reach Saigon Port. Here in Saigon Port, we handle general cargo destined for all the depots in the Saigon area. General cargo includes all cargo other than bulk am ammunition and bulk gasoline products. Here in Saigon, we bring ships up the river and berth them at our berth facilities, of which there are six for the discharge of the vessels onto the quay side, or we tie ships on anchorage on the buoys for discharge onto barge 
and by barge distribution through the inland waterway system to the depot sites. We use a wide range of equipment here in Saigon Port, ranging all the way from small forklifts to 60-ton floating cranes. This equipment includes landing craft, patrol boats such as the one we're on, landing craft utilities, barges, lighterage, tugs, and other floating craft. Additionally, on the shore, we use light trucks, heavy trucks, cranes, forklifts, and a wide variety of materials handling equipment. Generally, the cargo is moved from ship side onto the quay side onto trucks for port clearance through to the depots located here in the Saigon area. We also have some 10 in transit warehouses where we stage cargo for moving to the depots. At Na Bay, we handle all ammunition. For explosive safety reasons, we do not bring ammunition ships here into the downtown Saigon port area. At Na Bay, there are no deep draft facilities for tying ships up at piers. The entire operation is done from ships anchored in the stream onto barges, and from barges, they're towed by the tugs up to six different barge discharge sites for offloading the barges onto trucks and then delivery up to the various ammunition depots belonging to the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force, the Vietnamese Army, or the Vietnamese Air Force. Down at Vung Tau, we have a, another small port activity to support the Vung Tau support area. Here again, we have no deep draft berthing facilities and in any shoreside activity. We must discharge ships from in the stream on buoys at anchorage into lighterage. From there, it's towed ashore by barges and by tugs to barge discharge sites, where by cranes, we take it off the barges, load it onto trucks for onward delivery into the depot area. Some of the problems that we encounter here in operation in the Saigon port complex the river system is not secure at night. All ships and our barges must transit the river during daylight hours under escort. The VC control the area at night, and we do not move the ships into the Saigon area during the hours of darkness. Last September, when we came in and started operating in Saigon port, we were confronted with a backlog of cargo and a backlog of shipping awaiting discharge. During last fall and winter, the backlog was absorbed. Today, we are discharging almost 100% more cargo than what we were last fall. No military cargo is delayed. No ships are backlogged. Cargo comes into the Saigon port complex and moves through to depots without delay. Last month here in Saigon, we handled almost a quarter of a million tons of cargo. More docking facilities are under construction for the swiftly growing port complex at Cam Ranh Bay, Vietnam. Here, a DeLong pier is being built for the loading and unloading of cargo. The pier is supported by 10 caissons, or legs. The caissons are driven into place by a pile hammer, which has a striking force of 20,000 pounds. Preparations are made for the installation of fenders to protect the sides of the pier. The fenders, each weighing 2,600 pounds, are made of metal with wooden slats. A fender is lowered into the water where it will be secured to the caissons. The DeLong Pier was designed by former Army Engineer Colonel Louis B. DeLong and has proved successful in providing expanded pier space for the vessels with military cargo awaiting unloading in Cameron Bay. Eleven July on the parade field at the Pentagon, 
Ceremonies are held for the newly created post of Sergeant Major of the Army. To Sergeant Major William O. Wooldridge, seen here with Army Chief of Staff General Harold K. Johnson, goes the honor of becoming the Army's highest ranking enlistee. Selected from among more than 4,700 sergeants major now on active duty, Wooldridge will represent the enlisted man on the Army staff, serving as consultant on enlisted matters to the Chief of Staff. A salute to the colors. And a 19-gun salvo gets the ceremonies underway. The new Army Sergeant Major, accompanied by his chief, troops the line. The crack 3rd Infantry Old Guard from Fort Myer participates in the occasion. The colorful ceremonies symbolize the dedication of the Army enlisted man since the founding of our nation. Sergeant Major Wooldridge, formerly of the 1st Infantry Division, has served in the Army for 25 years. His children are among the spectators watching the swearing-in proceedings. General Johnson administers the oath of the new office while Mrs. Wooldridge looks on. In keeping with Army tradition, Mrs. Wooldridge is given the honor of helping General Johnson pin on the insignia of her husband's new position. Army Secretary Stanley R. Reeser congratulates the first sergeant major to serve on the Army General Staff. Wooldridge also receives the good wishes of general staff officers and high-ranking civilians in the Department of the Army. Sharpshooters from 52 countries have come on July 14th to Wiesbaden, Freudenburg, Germany for the 39th contest for the World Shooting Championships. High-ranking United States military officers attend the events. The German Shooting Club is host for this year's matches in association with the International Shooting Union. Matches are held for pistol, rifle, and trap shooting. The contest this year is the largest of its kind ever held. The United States and the Soviet Union have entered full 40-member teams. At the other end of the scale are nations with only one representative. Members of the West German team make up the last contingent in the parade. Minister Dr. Zinn, representing the West German government, delivers the welcoming address. 37 titles are to be awarded with individual medals for winners. On the first day, the women's trap shooting match is held and the United States representative Charlotte Birkenkamp places second. At the small bore pistol range, Staff Sergeant Edwin Teague of the U.S. Air Force shoots a near-perfect score. Following matches include the small-bore rifle English match from prone, kneeling, and standing positions for women and men, and a new event for air rifles. Awards are presented for individual and combined team scores. In the small-bore prone matches, Lieutenant Margaret Thompson, U.S. Women's Army Corps, places second. And the U.S. women, including Miss Thompson, Patricia Kinsella, and Marianne Jensen, win silver medals with a combined score. For the men, Marine Warrant Officer David Boyd and William Krilling place first and third. And with Captain Donald Adams, and Lone's Wigger of Fort Benning capture the team trophy for prone position. Lieutenant Gary Anderson sets a new world record to win the overall English match. And with Miss Thompson, Wigger, and Tommy Poole wins the team trophy for the 40-shot kneeling match. 